Well, this is the basic checklist. Um, it's been around a little bit, as you can see. Normally these reside in your G-suit because it doesn't take too long before pretty much everything that you need to know in the cockpit for pre-flight is uh, taken care of automatically. You just know what's there. And you just take a peek down there, make sure that it was clear. Then you're looking at the, the front gear. Mainly, you want to look, see, make sure there's no leaks down there on that piston. Well, that's the pitot tube. And you'd want to make sure this was removed. <laughs> Little hole there. When you're flying through the air, the uh, air goes in there and it Back here, it measures the pressure, and that gives you your true airspeed. That is a CBU unit, cluster bomb unit. Um, bunch of little bomblets in there. When they're released, the air pressure comes in the front and blows them out the back. You'd have a external fuel tank here and your weapons would be carried like on that pylon there and a center line pylon or you could have a center line fuel tank and you get a look under while we were on the other side there we should have been checking that that strut on that uh, landing gear for leaks. Looking at the tire. They say you should be able to rattle these things. I don't know what good that ever did. What are those things? These are the nozzles for the engine and they're mainly, mainly concerned with the afterburner. When the afterburner is not lit, these act like a, a diaphragm and they'll, they'll compress down to about this size. When the afterburner kicks in, they open up to allow for all that mass to come through and then they close back down. Uh, it was designed by the Navy. The Air Force saw it, said, hey, we could use that. So, uh, with a few modifications, the F4C was built. They always kept the tail hook because they found that uh, on occasion it could help us out too. We had a, at the end of all of our runways, there was a cable. And if a person came in, for instance, with a hydraulic failure and didn't have brakes, that cable would catch him. Uh, you know, unfortunately, because we were, we were constrained from operating our airplanes at maximum performance. Uh, the higher-ups in the Air Force were very concerned about their safety records. They didn't want to lose air crews. And uh, otherwise, we'd have been flying them harder than we did and we would have maybe found that they weren't as forgiving as we thought they were. <laughs> you can refuel as many times as you, as you want to. I think the longest I ever flew was 13 hours. Uh, you got a KC-135 that you rendezvous with, and then uh, one by one you pull up under the KC-135 and you pop a little door on the back here on top of this airplane and he pokes you with a big tube and fills you up with gas. Well on the left side here you got a panel that you can't see that's got the throttles. So your left hand's down there, your right hand is here on the stick. Well this is a trim button. It controls subtle changes in your flight uh, um, 
your ailerons, your elevator, as your speed changes through the air, so the dynamics shift on the airplane as your weight changes. And you control it all with that button. It's going a lot. It's going almost all the time, like this. Just trying to keep that, all the pressures off the stick. If it's well trimmed, you can take your hand off the stick and it'll fly straight and level. Here's your radar screen. Uh, you uh, have a screen about this big. The guy in the back seat's got one about like this. When he acquires a target back there, you'll see everything up here on this screen, along with some other information regarding are you in parameters for the weapon that you have selected, whether it be a sparrow or a sidewinder, and um, where the target is, what your closure rate is. Little dots are going to guide you. And if it's in the, within this circle, you're cleared to fire. Underneath, if you can see it right there, there's a little projector. That projector shines up onto this glass. And to you, it appears to be a circle. And in the circle, is a, in the center, that is a dot. And that's an aim point. That's used to aim your guns, aim your rockets, aim your bombs. Here's your bomb button. And in front of this is a trigger for the gun. Now if you're refueling, this button will give you an automatic breakaway. If something goes wrong or you're not comfortable or whatever and you want to release, you use this one. That's the, got the wonderful name, it's called the guillotine. Let's say you're sitting on the ground, you're all strapped in, and there's a mortar attack, and you want to get out in a hurry. The first thing you do is you grab this handle, pull it up, it cuts all the straps. You're, you got leg straps on, you got a lap belt, you got shoulder harness for your parachute, all of those are cut. If your canopy is closed, you pull, the canopy will blow off, you stand up and walk out of the airplane. There are two ways to eject from this airplane. The first one's right here between your legs. There's a, see that yellow handle? Mm -hmm. Okay, in a high G situation where it's hard to get your hands up, you reach down, you pull that and you'll eject. Now, conversely, let's say you're at high altitude, high speed, going straight and level. You reach back here, grab your handles, pull forward and down, and it pulls a, a screen down over your face mask to this position, and you give it a final pull, and it will eject you. And you have the virtue of having an extra screen in front of your face for high-speed ejection. The greatest lesson I ever had in flying was one day we were starting basic instruments. And, of course, I was chasing all the instruments. And my instructor said, Fletcher, stop. Don't move the stick. And I stopped and all the instruments stopped. <laughs> now that, that's a lesson, a beautiful lesson. When you, when, you, when you roll out of the chocks in an F4, it's like a, you're in a big bundle of muscle. So by the time you get into a combat situation, you really don't think too much about what the problems are as far as am I going to die or not. That's uh, somewhere else. you got a job to do, and um, in a way, uh, as everybody knows, as a flyer, you're relatively detached from the environment, uh, the environment where your weapons land, for instance. Um, 
it becomes a little more personal when the anti-aircraft uh, guns open up and you're going down on your bomb run and pulling out on your bomb run and all the time you get these little flashes black smoke going every place uh, it's not too bad there but when it gets up here you got problem well that's about as close as you get and you can't hear it you just see it so what we would do we'd fly up there with a load of, of bombs and missiles like 10 750 pound bombs missiles we'd go up and we'd find our target and we'd bomb it and then we'd go up and orbit and the MiGs didn't want anything to do with us at that point we were an unknown factor and they stayed away from us they'd go uh, either they wouldn't fly or they'd go up to the Chinese border and orbit do some training and then when we were gone they'd come back and land we also were flying in the south uh, mainly in trying to interdict the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail you have to remember we're talking 1965 which was really the early days of the build-up um, and then I was there in 66 uh, during that period, I think people still had thoughts that we can make this deal work. Um, after that, in the, in the later years, I think is when people's opinions began to shift a little bit, and uh, it became more obvious the direction things were going. We came back, uh, landed one time and we're taxing into the parking place and the crew chief is out there giving us the, you know, and then his head's going like this. Well, we had 52 holes in the side of the airplane and we didn't even know it. One of my best friends in pilot training, a guy named Barry Bridger, <laughs> um, got, um, uh, his flight got hit by a SAM and uh, his airplane went down. He spent uh, four and a half, five years in the Hanoi Hilton. Well, all we heard is that he'd been shot down. And I think, thinking back on it, my initial reaction was rather just being numb. It, it, it's, a, it's a loss. When I think of those dumb iron bombs that we were dropping up north releasing at 5,000 feet on a target the size of a bridge collateral damage uh, it's sad it is absolutely sad I just wish it would be fun if uh, everybody in the United States that wanted to could get a ride in the back seat of one of these things open up their eyes a little bit, give them something to think about.